A poor man interprets the Constitution and he changes America. It sounds like a fairy tale, but it's actually true. I'm here at the National Constitution Center, a place where you can learn about the framers, the Constitution, and its core values. This is the story of one poor man who didn't know much about American history, but he thought he'd been treated unfairly, and he knew just enough about the Constitution to do something about it. Now, you may think watching this today that your voice can't be heard or doesn't matter, but Clarence Earl Gideon changed the way we administer justice in this country, and he did it from a prison cell. A turn off Route 98 in Bay Harbor, Florida is not a trip down memory lane. Memories here don't last as long as the smoke from the local paper mill. Take this empty lot. Today you'd never know it, but history was made here. And the pool hall is gone and so are the people. But the principle they left is still standing. This is Clarence Earl Gideon. He wasn't much at pool, and he was almost as bad at life. He was a very unlikely constitutional hero, but you know, the cases that come to the court don't usually come from the winners in society, they come from the losers. Clarence Gideon was poor. He had been involved in the criminal justice system ever since he was a kid. He had been getting in trouble. Trouble seemed to find Gideon, like on June 3rd, 1961, when he was arrested for a crime that amounted to pocket change. Literally, small change had gone missing from this cigarette machine and from this jukebox. Maybe five to sixty dollars total in the Bay Harbor pool room on the edge of Panama City, Florida. That's the pool hall there on the bottom. Some wine, some beer, and a few bottles of Coca-Cola were also gone. A witness claimed he saw Gideon that night, his pockets bulging with change. For the change in the stolen drinks, Gideon found himself facing some very serious time in prison. CBS reports, The Poor Man and the Law. The case of Clarence Earl Gideon set the stage for a great turning point in American jurisprudence. The Look at this. The Gideon case became such a big deal that CBS News did a primetime documentary about it using the actual people to reenact the courtroom scene word for word. An educational film did the same thing a little bit later, but in color. The man with a deep sense of his legal rights. There's a very famous book about it written by this man, Anthony Lewis, called Gideon's Trumpet. And they made the book into a movie starring Henry Fonda. I'm entitled to a lawyer. The next case on the docket is the case of the state of Florida versus Clarence Earl Gideon. What says the state? Are you ready for trial? The state is ready, Your Honor. What says the defendant? Are you ready for trial? I'm not ready, Your Honor. Gideon was flat broke. So broke he had spent the last two months here in the county jail because he couldn't even afford bail. There was no way he could pay for a lawyer. I have no counsel. Wait, 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 stop. Rewind. Okay. I know this is black and white film and bad acting, but this is a turning point in our story. Sorry for interrupting, but I didn't want you to miss it. I have no counsel. Why do you not have counsel? Do you know that your case was set for trial today? Your Honor, I request this court to appoint counsel to represent me in this trial. I'm sorry, but I will have to deny your request to appoint counsel to defend you in this case. But Gideon was a stubborn old man who thought this was unfair. The United States Supreme Court says I'm entitled to be represented by counsel. He had this obsession that he was entitled to a lawyer. He was wrong, of course. Under the laws that stood before he began the case, he was wrong. Well, half wrong. Here's how it works. We actually live under two sets of laws, federal and state. Most crimes and small infractions, like driving through a stop sign, fall under state laws. Criminal law is mostly state law. 90% of criminal cases in this country today are state cases. Tax evasion, smuggling, interstate crime, they will land you in federal court. In federal cases, the court had laid down the rule that all defendants were entitled to lawyers. Gideon was being tried by the state of Florida. So in 1961, in a state court, he was not automatically entitled to a lawyer. By asking the court to appoint a lawyer, Gideon thought he was asserting a right written into the Sixth Amendment, the right to counsel. This right 
is as basic as any right in the American Constitution, because the threat uh, that is presented by arrest and imprisonment and sometimes even execution is as great as any threat uh, that the Constitution allows the government to have. You need a lawyer who will go into court for you and argue on your behalf, who will find out the facts and present your case. You really feel the power of the state bearing down on you when you're in a criminal proceeding. You have a judge sitting on a bench. You have a prosecutor at a prosecution table. And the defense lawyer is really the only person fit into the process to stand there with the defendant to make sure that they are not going through this very scary, intimidating process alone. We are committed in our country to an adversary system by which we mean that each side is entitled to have a competent lawyer present its position. You'll see in a good adversarial process that when the prosecution does present the case, that the defense lawyer's role is to come in and challenge that case. And our founding fathers believe that through that kind of push and pull of an adversarial process, the truth would somehow emerge and a jury would be left with enough information to decide what really happened. But Clarence Earl Gideon had to defend himself because the state of Florida had denied him a lawyer. The entire trial lasted only a day, and the jury found him guilty before it was time for dinner. He was sentenced to the maximum, five years in prison. For thousands of cases just like this, the story ends here, walking into prison and doing the time. But this time, Gideon went to prison convinced he didn't belong there. He still said he was innocent and that without a lawyer, the state of Florida didn't give him a fair trial. So he did something most people would attribute to insanity or fairy tales. With a pencil and a prison notepad, Clarence Earl Gideon wrote a petition to the Supreme Court of the United States. The Supreme Court has a category of cases it calls informer pauperous cases. That means cases brought to the court by people who are too poor to pay the usual fees and too poor to print up their documents. Poor people can file just with a typewritten or even handwritten document and Gideon's was handwritten. It was a letter on line prison stationery. You couldn't imagine a simpler, more elementary way of getting to the highest court in the land. But why would the Supreme Court decide to hear the case of a poor man with no lawyer who was already in prison? Because the Constitution allows even the poorest citizens to be heard and have an impact on the rest of us. Lightning strikes from the ground up. It may have been sparked by Gideon, but there on the court was Justice Hugo Black, ready to catch it. He was the most influential member of the Supreme Court during his time. Black felt that people should not be disadvantaged in getting justice because they are poor. As a judge, his Bible was the Constitution. We had the best Constitution in the world. And if we would follow it, it'd be all right. He always kept the Constitution in his pocket. And I, as most of his former clerks, keep the Constitution. So that when there's a question, you know, you look to the Bible, you look to the language. Alabama Senator Hugo Black was President Roosevelt's first nominee to the Supreme Court. It was big news in 1937. And for over 30 years on the Supreme Court, from FDR through the Civil Rights Movement, on into the Nixon administration, Hugo Black stood for the equality of the ordinary citizen. Black had been the champion on the court for the principle that the various provisions of the Bill of Rights should be applied to the states. The passage of the 14th Amendment made the Bill of Rights applicable to the states. Okay, here's what this means. The Bill of Rights, which originally applied only to Congress and the federal government, also applies to the states because the 14th Amendment says states can't deny citizens fundamental rights. The 14th Amendment, passed in the bitter aftermath of the Civil War, was virtually neglected by the courts until Hugo Black argued that it could no longer be ignored. Every citizen, rich or poor, no matter what state they live in, said Black, is entitled to the same fundamental rights. But when Black arrived at the Supreme Court, the court didn't see things his way. The majority of the justices, these men, believe states should have more independence from the federal government. Early in Black's tenure on the court, a case would test Black's interpretation of the 14th Amendment. 
That case was Betts versus Brady, and Black was on the losing side. And Justice Black dissented in that case. It's a famous dissent. What he said was, in substance, you can't have a fair trial without a lawyer. So in the Betts case, Black writes, the Sixth Amendment says citizens have the right to a lawyer, and the Fourteenth Amendment says states can't deny that right. That a state can't deny people a lawyer because they are too poor to pay for one. He was in the minority, six to three. The court decided that the states did not have to give everyone a lawyer, only those who were thought to have special circumstances. Then there had been one case after another in which the Supreme Court had been defining what was meant by special circumstances. And what happened was that more and more defendants and their lawyers tried to show the court that they their client was entitled to a lawyer because they suffered from some special disability. The rule that you don't need a lawyer was being eaten up by the exceptions. And over the course of two decades, it seemed that each exception proved Black right in the Betts case. And he seethed for 20 years. He really thought Betts and Brady was decided the wrong way. He dissented and he meant it and he kept saying it for 20 years until it came time to decide Gideon against Wainwright. Now that the Gideon case was before the Supreme Court, Gideon really needed a lawyer. So the Supreme Court appointed Abe Fortas. Clarence Earl Gideon, who had no lawyer when he was tried in Florida, had appointed to be his lawyer in the Supreme Court, someone who was probably one of the half dozen sharpest lawyers in the United States. You know, they don't appoint uh, the most powerful lawyer in the United States to represent somebody unless they want a deluxe performance. And he wanted to win 9 nothing. Abe Fortas knew that nine justices rarely all agree. But when they do, a unanimous decision sends a message to everyone that this is a principle that's here to stay. That's something lawyers like to call establish the principle. Abe Crash knows a thing or two about that. I was his field general, so to speak. He really set out from the beginning to establish the principle. That every man, the rich, the poor, and the poor as well as the rich, was entitled to the benefit of counsel. And that principle was very much drove us as we worked on the case. On the other side of the argument was Bruce Jacob, Florida's young assistant attorney general. And Jacob's team was, well, Jacob and his wife. When I was working on the Gideon Brief, my wife and I would drive up here to Tallahassee uh, to this library every weekend, or almost every weekend, and do research here. It was all on his own. He didn't have a big law firm. He had nobody else from the attorney general's office. I gave it everything I had in, in terms of time and energy and work because I'm a lawyer. That's what lawyers do. Lawyers, when a lawyer takes a case, a lawyer you know, puts his heart into it. Of course, the irony here is that Jacob was doing all this work to argue against a person's guaranteed right to a lawyer. He took that argument and his inexperience into the Supreme Court in January 1963. At the time of the argument, I'd never even seen the Supreme Court. He was really outgunned. I felt like I was caught in a crossfire because the justice over here would ask a, a question. There are nine people asking you questions. And one justice would ask a question, then before I had answered that question, someone else would ask a question, then maybe a third person would ask a question. Bruce Jacob was interrupted 92 times <laughs> by questions from the Supreme Court. It came so fast. It was a brutal experience. It really was. The irony is that uh, Florida didn't think that um, indigent defendants needed lawyers, and they didn't seem to think that they needed many lawyers either. We argued uh, essentially the reasoning that was that was used in the decision of Betts versus Brady by the Supreme Court back in 1941 or 1942. Jacob took the traditional states' rights or federalist position that states should be able to decide for themselves who does or doesn't get a lawyer without federal interference. Fortis saw this argument coming and argued that because of the special circumstances clause in Betts versus Brady, federal courts were forced to intervene in states' cases. Jacob argued that if the court sided with Fortis, it might force the states to free thousands of other inmates who had been convicted without having a lawyer. The entire country was in danger of having a lot of uh, hardened criminals turned loose on society. But that cannot deter us from doing justice in the individual case. Fortis argued, in effect, that many of those people were sent to prison just like Gideon, 
and that made the principle here even more important. That the 14th Amendment made it clear that states had to abide by the fundamental rights laid out by the Bill of Rights, including the Sixth Amendment's right to counsel. The time had certainly come when this basic principle of justice had to be established. On the morning of March 18th, the decision was announced from the bench of the Supreme Court. Chief Justice Warren turned to Justice Black and said, like this, just nodded, and Justice Black said, I have for announcement the decision and opinion of the court, Gideon against Wainwright. Here was Justice Black's vindication for 20 years of dissent from Betts against Brady. He said, we were wrong when we decided Betts against Brady, and now we're finally making it right. For Hugo Black, the vindication was complete. Not only did his belief in the 14th Amendment carry the day, but largely because of Black, the court decided in Gideon's favor, nine to nothing. The decision was unanimous. It was one of Black's greatest opinions. The day had arrived when this principle for which he had fought for so long as a justice was now the law of the land. The court had now truly established the principle, hanging right over its front door. Equal justice under law. When the Supreme Court decided the Gideon case, they really breathe life into that phrase. And it doesn't matter if you're rich, it doesn't matter if you're poor, you get the same equal chance. Just look at what happened to Gideon. His win at the Supreme Court didn't set Gideon free, but it gave him a second trial. That gave the people who made these films an excuse to hire Gideon's real attorney, Fred Turner, to play himself. Here he's pretending to investigate the case, which he did. And here he's pretending to argue the case, which he did much better than Gideon. He poked holes in the state's case. That is an awful lot of change to jam into those pockets. And this time, with a competent attorney. Not guilty. So, sir, you all gentlemen? Yes, sir. Clarence Earl Gideon was a free man. The man who had won a landmark Supreme Court case went back to a modest and honest living, working odd jobs and pumping gas. Free because of the principle he'd helped to establish. When I go to the United States Supreme Court and I see where it reads equal justice under law, I'm very inspired by that. I, I'm very comforted by that. But I'm also provoked by that because I know that we don't have equal justice under law. I know that even now, even after Gideon, lots of poor people are treated unfairly. I see it as an aspiration, but I don't see it as something we've realized yet. It takes more than one person to turn a principle into a common practice. But the value of that right is that it's there, written into the Constitution and established as a goal for society to reach for and to live up to. People will fall short. Rights can be ignored or even trampled. But that's why it's written down. So that even a stubborn old man in prison can protect himself with nothing more than a pencil and some knowledge. If you know your rights, you can protect your rights. If you don't know your rights, you can't. They'll always be there if we protect them, if we fight for them, if we make sure they're not taken away. And that's the essence of the Gideon story. He understood he had a right, and it was being taken away from him, and he fought to get it back.